your attention, please. Uh, before I open this meeting officially, I'd better read out some rules and regulations. <coughs> please, uh, please do not make any recordings until the chair declares the meeting open. Firearm. In the event that firearm sound, please make your way to the nearest fire exit and follow the instructions of officers <coughs> and fire marshals. Assembly points is across the car park. I'm switching off. Makes more noise than the first. <laughs> okay, that better. <laughs> no smoking. Smoking is not permitted in Mayside Fire and Rescue Authority buildings. Toilets are located further along this corridor on the opposite side, with signs clearly marking each door. If you require to use these facilities, please respect the conduct of the business and attend to the room without delay. Leaving the meeting, should you be requested to leave this meeting for any reason other than an emergency, you will be required to switch off any recording quickly and leave the meeting with all your belongings. Privacy and confidentiality. Request anyone present who has any items relating to person, private, confidential, or exempt information to ensure that these items are not on display until such time that they may be required. Recordings. Inform all present that proceeding on the meeting may be recorded. Request. If any observer have any objections to being recorded and offer the opportunity to leave the meeting. Mobile phones, equipment, please switch to silent. Now that's that. I am Councillor Mar, chaired this meeting, and I've declared this meeting officially open. Okay. We go on to family matters. Apologies. Chair, we have a request for apologies from Councillor Byron, but Councillor Hanlat is acting as an alternate. Um, Councillor Tony Robertson isn't here yet. But <coughs> Any declaration of interest? <coughs> See, considering matters of urgency to which it comes to the end of the day, would not be in the interest of the efficient operation. So nothing to go on. There are no matters that require the exclusion of the press and the public due to the story of exempt information. No? Now we go to the minutes of the previous meeting. <coughs> on the 2nd of December, any matters of our... Go to agenda item 3 and consider the recommendations contained there. Four. Jams, if you consider the agenda. Thanks, Chair. The uh, purpose of the report, members, is to update you on progress in relation to matters of consultation and negotiation with the rep bodies since uh, that, that which has occurred since the last meeting on the 2nd of December 2014. The report is in the standard format that you'll all be familiar with now, so I will take you through each of the items and talk in a little bit of detail to each one. Paragraph 4 is an update on progress around consultation, negotiation with service instructions. <coughs> Since the last meeting in December, a total of 59 new and amended service instructions being agreed, signed off, with 10 remaining within the, uh, within the process. And I think it's a, it's a point that's been made on a number of times previously at that, uh, within, this, uh, within this committee, that that is a, a significant amount of work that gets done, which is in addition to, if you like, some of the more substantive items that we've, uh, we've had to wrestle with over the, uh, over the course of the last few years, not least those which arise from the, uh, the ongoing financial challenges faced by the, the authority. Paragraphs 5 and 6 relate to the periodic review of the, the duty system. Members will recall that we moved to a uh, 12-12 from 9-15 duration duty system on the 3rd of January 2014. 
and within the collective agreement that gave rise to the change that was say, reviewed, that was built in. And following on from the uh, dialogue at the, um, within the Joint Secretaries, it was agreed that the review would be postponed until such time as we had revisited and resolved the issue of 24-hour working, which is covered in the report of paragraph 7 to 16. Don't propose to speak in detail around the, the specifics within paragraph 7 to 16, but what I will say is that <coughs> through what's been a very constructive dialogue with the rep bodies, particularly <coughs> colleagues in the Fire Brigade Union, I think what we've managed to do over the course of the last couple of months is to deliver an outcome which meets the aspirations of a large number of staff to work 24 hour shifts, but also delivers for the Fire Rescue Authority three of the four whole time retained appliances which have been required as a result of the structural changes that we're having to make through the financial challenges which are given rise to the, the either the mergers or in the instance of the outlet the, uh, the closure of that station and the relocation of the fire engine to Old Swan. And if I can, I'll just talk you very briefly through the way that we've arrived at this, this outcome. And it's been through myself, Phil, sitting down with Mark and Kevin and talking through the <coughs> very legitimate aspirations of their members around the to work 24 hour shifts, their views around whole time retain, the fact that the the requirement to work 42 hours whole time retain covered in an eight day reference period was viewed by some as being more than that they would want to commit to. So what we looked at was well okay how can we how can we dilute that, how can we limit that and in the same and at the same time how can we expand the opportunity then for more people to work the 24. So what we came up with was to identify eight, or rather in principle would agree we'll, we'll introduce the 24 hour working on eight locations, we'll pair two of the locations, so you'd have four sets of paired, um, two paired stations if you like, which would uh, effectively deliver a virtual two pump hold time, one pump hold time the same station which would limit the amount of retained cover that staff would have to do in an eight day reference period instead of it being two days retained cover, it would take that down to one. And as I say, it would double the number of people that were able to work that GC system. So we sought expressions of interest in relation to that broad principle. We got over 350 returns back, which was spread pretty much across all of the, the, the service. And what that allowed us to do was to focus in on using the key stations, if you like, the 10 key stations, so eight of the 10 key stations, we will like, we'll choose those locations because there was, there was good numbers of people that had expressed an interest from those stations, which is of course one of, the, one of the matters or one of the issues we wanted to try to avoid was after post large numbers of people to cause, to try to minimise it, if you like, any disruption that might arise from us implementing this uh, this new duty system. So we went back out with a specific proposal around the eight locations and we got sufficient expressions of interest back to cruise six of the eight stations and we, last week we met with uh, so Phil and I met with Mark and Kevin and we, we had a good uh, we had a good talk through the returns that we'd received and we came to a collective view as to the best way to proceed and I think I think what that shows is it's that, that is indicative of just what is achievable when you have good, good foundation for the industrial relations, you have those good relationships and it shows what you can deliver when you work together collectively because I think it would be a matter for Mark to speak for himself but the fact that we didn't receive the expressions of interest in Liverpool is not something in any way that we should be that we should be uh, in any way downbeat and what that shows is the process worked. It allows it allowed, if you like, people to make a choice and what it allows us to do is to then we can revisit 
how we provide them the same cover in Liverpool, and that's something that we're going to work on and we are committed to work on. So, what I've tried to do is summarise if you like, the, the outcome, which should see from on or around the 1st of April people being given notice of, of the moves and us being able to manage that in such a way that limits the disruption on staff but delivers 24 hour working for all of those staff, certainly the majority of the staff who've expressed the interest to do that but it also delivers the three of the four whole time retained pumps for the, for the authority. Moving on to paragraph 17 through 19 Following on from the, uh, the, the most recent recall conference of the, uh, the National the Executive Committee of the, of the FBU, the decision has been taken to vary the action short of strike arising from the National Pensions dispute to limit that now to undertaking MTFA, so more than telling us firearms attack duties and cross border mobilisations into services which are affected by industrial action. So the, the, you like the, the additional voluntary hours limitation has now been removed and what that's allowed us to do is, is to commence a discussion around how we might reintroduce additional voluntary hours in conjunction with the introduction of 24 hour work and so on stations across the piece here so the principle of you like of uh, devolving responsibility for staffing down to the lowest level down to stations service instruction around what's based South Austin in there which you provide us with a solid foundation on which to build on and on which to seek as best as we can to ensure whole time appliance availability across the service whilst at the same time affording members of staff the ability to work additional volunteer hours and therefore to earn additional money at the same time. So that's something that we are engaged in there uh, or is a, I think a very constructive dialogue as well and if our experience is through the 24 hours and the whole time the team where it was any to go by I'm very confident indeed that we'll get a similarly positive outcome in, uh, in that regard. That's, uh, that concludes the substantive issues on the update chair so I'll pause at that point and uh, take any questions if there are any. Could I be quite any questions? Mark, do you want to make a contribution first? Yeah, thanks Chair. Um, I think the report again, uh, as the Chief said, sometimes the, the briefest of paragraphs had uh, the largest amount of work in uh, paragraph four, uh, as we've said before, at uh, CNC meetings. It uh, talks about the, the 59 year old amended service instructions and open the minutes of the last meeting uh, a waiting lunch is being looked at where we can sit down with the four party members and discuss in depth. Uh, I think it, it is and would be something that you'd find very, very interested. Because uh, it's not just issues, uh, the large issues that sometimes come to the floor. These are just the, the normal run, run the mill day to day uh, activities uh, of our firefighters and, and how these um, agreements affect them. Um, so I think you will find it very interesting. So I'll ask that, that that meeting does go ahead, Chair. And again, the rest of the report's uh, details, as, you said, as the Chief said previously, uh, with quite a lot of significant changes to, the, to things like duty systems, pay and working conditions and that um, when when the uh, coalition government started to outline the, the nature and the depth of the attacks there was a firm commitment given by the chief and the union then that we would um, do everything possible to put the public on their side first and neither the chief fire officer and the principal officer team nor the FBU and our executive have ever moved away from that commitment um, despite things becoming a little bit difficult year on year uh, as, the, as the cuts just got deeper and deeper. Um, but the issue uh, that the Chief talks about there as well, um, about the whole swan location and speak not picking up the offer of 24 call time and time, it is an important point because that clearly demonstrated to our members that the choice was theirs, and, and that's important it's in the face of so many things that are out of their control, to have that choice over their shifts and to have some sort of ability to choose what shift pattern they want to work, it is very, very important. So it, it is something that should be celebrated in, in a strange fashion that we didn't get those because it does indicate that the system did, did work. Um, in relation to the um, funds additional hours, we have had dialogue um, as, as recently as last week with the Chief Officer and the Deputy Chief Officer um, to 
look at uh, a range of um, proposals from the five years union, and these are purely based around um, maintaining a flight availability in the face of further attacks from this uh, rather aggressive government that we have in, in at the moment. Um, and it is primarily about having the right amount of people on the appliances 24-7 uh, to respond to uh, every eventuality and every incident that we turn out to. And that dialogue it has been very, very positive to start off with and is going and is, is ongoing. We're hopeful that we can move quite quickly to uh, to agreements on that and, and again put the public uh, on the other side first and foremost where we should be about to Want to make a contribution? You okay? Yeah. Oh, which question now? Not a quick comment really. I'd just like to congratulate everybody who's been involved in this work. From the FBU to the board to the personnel department to the deputy chief and the plateau chief. I think the work that's gone here is marvellous. It's must be two years now since the Ken Knight came out with his report. And I know that me and me have been travelling up and down the country. And there's a side has come in for some criticism. We're not having a clear we did, we had LLAR, but we did come under some criticism. Now we have got put in all time firefighters. And that's what the people, I know the chief went around all the districts within Merseyside. That's what the people wanted, that's what elected members wanted. They didn't want part time firefighters going out. They weren't trained as well as the firefighters that we have in Merseyside. So with everybody agreeing, it's made things a lot easier. I do accept. Mark that it still needs to be choice. Not everybody can do it, but then who can should feel entitled to earn that little bit more. I wish it was more, but with 20 million we've lost through this government to the Spy Authority. So, congratulations to everybody. Really, really done well. We've come on with it. It's just a, a comment here. Yeah. It's always been said that um, because of the Costs imposed upon the authority that uh, really there's been no choice. Well, really, you can disagree with that because I haven't spent uh, 40 years in politics, so there's a different choice. But it is, it is for the people of the city and the land surrounding it, is it not I'm saying um, that the choices that have been made by, by the FPU and the other trade unions have been one that I believe. As has been said, they put the people first. Um, it's easy to turn around and say, "Well, no, I'm not accepting that." I mean, no isn't easy. There's an easy response, um, and then it's just nothing happens. Um, well, in reality, we almost I mean, it does happen because things don't stand still, um, and it takes a lot of courage sometimes to sit down and negotiate. Whereas it's simple just to say no. Um, I've, I've seen it, and I've seen it. And I, I, I know on my behalf, and that's what I said about the city, and I talk about on behalf of the I'm sure that you talk about uh, on behalf of every, every, every member that the courage that has been shown by the trade unions over the years um, need, needs to be recognised, and also by, by our own officers out on the other side as part of the negotiations as well, because it's easy, as I say, to say no and to walk away, but you know, what we've had is there's people who've put those to who that I'm here taking care of things. Uh, and I think that everybody who has been involved in this um, deserves it. We all agree we both the cats. Um, they're not here to say thank you, but you know, it's on our behalf that we to say thank you. So that, that's all I would say. Steve? Uh, thanks. thanks uh, I'd, I'd just like to echo the, the comments of um, the Rambler. I think the I'm sorry, can I just, it's not easy to do this, but seeing that being filmed, I should call you by your proper title, Councillor Hannah. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor <Councilor. laughs> um, I, I think when, when you look at the, uh, you know, the plan of that we're at the moment, I, I think that the, the, the change of um, you know, positions and the dialogue that we have now is more constructive and more positive. And, and for that, you know, the chair of the authority of that.
they're on the back of the sort of old service. We wouldn't basically have the front, front line to achieve what we need to. And on the back of that, we we'll have prevented the plane as well, and we, we know that we need to overtake. Um, so there's massive challenges that we've, we've, we've had over the last couple of years. And as we go forward now, um, I think we, we are in a better position than what we were a couple of years ago. And for that, you know, again, I thank everybody you know, from our officers and the chief, deputy chief, to, you know, to Nick and to, to, to Nick, for their work as well. And what Mark quite rightly said is that if you don't realise the amount of hours that's been put into this behind the scenes to ensure that we get the agreements for all parties and that mature discussion that's taking place to ensure that you know we all understand the pressures, the financial pressures of, of, of the authorities, and we all understand what we'd like to achieve, what the outcome is. And you know, we've got 44 days now before the general election, and the outcome of that election is going to be absolutely crucial to the fire service, absolutely <coughs> crucial on the future direction of the service. And what Linda said is quite right. We go out and we speak quite highly, quite positively, quite constructively about the, the fire service and what the fire service contribution is to the community, to working with our partners, with other blue light services by the way, trying to work collectively amongst us and we have achieved those same numbers that the government and have imposed on us. It's been difficult but we've done it. But it gets at that stage now that we think that enough is enough. You know, we can't really cut any further without it having a major impact on the delivery of our service. So as I say, the outcome of the election is crucial. I'm not being political. But if you have a Conservative government, it's already been made clear by the Chancellor that there's going to be £26 billion pounds of further cuts to the local government, to public services. And obviously we're part of that. And when you think about the £20 million pound that we've already achieved, it could be a further £20 million pound that we have to do. And we've already took the fruits away. You know, there's nothing much left. The majority of our budget goes from here to now. So, you know, what does any particular government, whatever the outcome of it might be, they have to look and examine the impact that they could have had to take. And I would call on them to have an assessment of what they've done, to sit back, take stock, and examine the uh, cuts right across the country, not just being on their side, but right across the country. You know, we've lost nearly 5,000 firefighters, God knows how many station closures. You know, we've lost 33% of our appliances, we are from 42 to 28. And that's going to be reduced even further with the, the energy going from going down to 24 or 4 on a retail goal. You know, the people of Merseyside expect us to respond as quick and as efficiently as possible. And that is adding us a pressure on the service. And it's only so much that we can take before something cracks. So as we go forward, the, the, the fire conference that was held recently in the uh, Gateshead, you know, the fire minister said about the future of the and, you know, there is challenges there, but, you know, I said when, when we've been out to um, station visits, I was supposed to the crews, you know, they say about the service has changed, it wasn't like it was 10 years ago. And I said, well, the way you have it today, it's not going to be like what it is today in 10 years' time. And there's been a lot of talk about the future and the development of the service and about how we fit in um, to, to the other service with the health agenda and things like that. And, you know, again, I'll give some assurances to our, our bodies is that we're, we're, we're going to look and examine at everything we possibly can to enhance the way of, of, of the fire service and the fire rescue service to make sure that we have our place in, in the community, that we secure our place in the community and we try and secure our future and our autonomy as an independent emergency service. We will and we can do some what we call efficiency services, that's, that's, a, that's a given, but it should not impact on our delivery, on our ability to deliver a first class service, so that's where we need to go. So whatever the outcome of the election, you know, if it's a Labour government, I'm sure that there will be uh, so more consideration of the way they've said that they're going to handle the budgets on a risk base and a deprivation, and if that's the case, then I would, I would hope that Merseyside would be better treated, and we will certainly be lobbying. Sure that you know 
all politicians, but for now, the impact and the effect that's had on, on our service and our community. So as we go forward, you know, the positive things that we're doing, I hope that that is reflected um, in, in the wider sense to all of our staff, because, you know, when we had the staff survey, we had the responses, some negative responses, um, back from our staff. And I understand some of that because of everything that's going on. All over the cash, and anybody who's, who's out there thinking that, you know, am I going to be next? That's my job, secure, and everything like that. So, we need to ensure that collectively we put out a positive message that we're trying to do our best and we want to do it together. You know, all of us have together. And I, I've said in the past again, if there's any ideas, any proposals, any suggestions that we haven't thought of, then please let us know. You know, and let's, let's have a look and examine how we can protect our service. We're all passionate about it, we all love it, and we all want to secure the jobs for our people and make sure that we deliver that first class service to the public. But we can't do it on our own. So, when we go out to uh, our staff, when we go out to our stations, when we get bullet points to, to the, the, the whole of the service, let's say these are the positive things that we've done. And, you know, it's not, it's not all that, we're trying our best. And that should be reflected. Because with the staff survey, Instructed that the lead member, uh, which is part of the council of the point, take a fair role in that to make sure that the action plan that we devise is, is implemented and that's spread out to the to the service. And we try to respond to uh, to the concerns that were picked up in the staff survey. But it should be positive because of, you know we're going through a difficult times. But you know we think that there's going to be there's some positive things there that will be part of this. And when we can do our our station. I think that is the end of the meeting. The next meeting we are going to take set for that. I can be in the next meeting. We have to go to the next meeting. Right, thank you very much for your attendance. I'll take you anyway. Maybe I'll go with you. Thank you. Thank you.